Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Very biased connection, obviously, as usual. Um, I would like to wrap up my little well, waffle uh, past two videos, if you want to watch them, about Cash-Woody algebras, generalizations for other groups, essentially. Um, and I want to uh, go to something that kind of still, still, even after all these years, still emerges from matrices in a more sophisticated way than a Lie algebra or a semi-simple Lie algebra or a Kachimudi algebra, but essentially in the same way. And it's kind of a really brilliant construction that I'm only really sketched because in the end, we'll see, it's, it's a bit complicated anyway. So these objects I'm going to explain go under various names. So I saw generalized Kachimudi algebras, I saw Borchardt's algebras, and I saw this one here, so Borchardt's Kachimudi algebras. Um, so I just went with Borchardt's Kachimudi algebras. Uh, we'll see what that is. I kind of try to, instead of giving the real definition, which is a bit tricky if you don't have enough background like me, uh, or instead of giving the real definition, I will just um, kind of sketch what they are supposed to do. And actually, it's pretty good. Um, it's not an easy answer because we're trying to construct a certain type of group. We'll see that in a second. And that group is just crazy, so we shouldn't expect uh, a really, really easy answer in this case. Okay, so there's a very, very famous um, anecdote, name, story, whatever, name, <laughs> story, uh, whatever. And it's about two very, very different objects. There is a client's J invariant, J, which we can just think of as being a function in Q. Well, there is some, some shift of variables that I'm not going to explain, forget that. So let's say it's a function in Q and it starts off with a Q inverse and then it's kind of a power series in uh, the remaining queues. So the first, first, and first two entries are not very interesting in some sense. Let, let, let me let me not explain why they're not very interesting. But anyway, so from Q onwards, it kind of gets gets interesting here, and you have some some crazy numbers that appear. Uh, this is called Klein's J invariant, and was around for a long, 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 long time. So yeah, Felix Klein, yeah, Klein's J invariant, and it's kind of a, a beloved gadget in number theory, in algebraic number theory, it study of, turns up in the study of elliptic curves, for example. Okay, right. that was along for around for a long time. And then like a hundred years later, let's say uh, this J invariant was around from 1850-ish, let's just, let's just pretend it's the case. And a hundred years later, let's just say 1950, people were studying those sporadic groups, so those, those uh, simple groups that kind of turn out of nowhere. And there was uh, around that time, I think, when the moonshine conjecture first came up, uh, the monster, so it was kind of the biggest possible spiral group, uh, was not quite constructed. But anyway, people believe that it exists anyway. Um, so, for example, I think people actually constructed the character table of the monster before they constructed the monster, which is a bit weird, but fine. Uh, so people were playing a lot around with the different types of structures, how to construct those sporadic groups, and they had character calculations coming from representation theory. So kind of people knew what to, to expect. And wrapping up and proving everything that's like really difficult, I'm not going to talk about that, but people knew what to expect. And there was this monster sporadic group, which is the largest among the uh, finite simple groups. Um, and I should have written, I, I guess I just wanted to make it fit into a line. It's certainly not the largest finite simple group. They are very big at la the largest finite simple groups. It's the largest sporadic finite simple group. Okay. So among the 24 sporadic ones, the weird ones, and not the ones not of Lee type, um, there are it's the largest. So, and we all know, uh, you know, I know, large, big is always good, big is always good. So people liked to study uh, this invariant. And there was this other one, as I said, the J invariant, which is very different. So one of them, group theory, the other one, number theory, uh, so very different. And then people observed, as I said, they already knew the CAC table, they already knew the representations. Um, they observed that this these numbers here, so the, the well, the one is a bit boring, <laughs> whatever, this number as well, as I said, I want to ignore this number. So this number is the dimension of the trivial representation of uh, the monster group. That's not very surprising. But maybe more surprising that this one is almost the dimension of the next biggest represent, uh, simple representation of the monster group. It is, the, the next simple is denoted by R2, the next uh, simple dimension. It is actually the trivial plus the next one. And it turns out that all of these numbers have some nice interpretation in terms of 
is the next one in terms of the simple representation of the monster group. They have their sums, okay, then they're, they're not spot on the simple representation, but it's not so bad. And you kind of it's kind of a lot of fun. You see all of them somewhat turning up. It's kind of really strange. So this was the moon trend observation, and people were wondering, is it a coincidence or is there really something going on? Um, usually I would think it's a coincidence, but I guess the point here is if you see such a number and it's spot on another number, uh, yeah, it's probably not a coincidence. The numbers are too big and would be just a very, very large, probably kind of really, really lucky if those two numbers were the same uh, for coincidence. And I'm not going into details here whether there are coincidences in mathematics anyway. Uh, but anyway, people were really curious what's going on um, and tried to understand uh, this relationship between two very, very, very different beasts, so two very, very different players. You know. And essentially what people then did is they constructed the models. Okay, fine. Um, usually what's what's happening is that the sporadic groups, they are always symmetries of certain objects. I just did it for uh, one of them, J2. Whatever J2 is, J2 is one of the sporadic groups. It's essentially the symmetry groups of the fatal plane, plus something extra. Let's not worry about something extra. It's essentially symmetries of certain well-known objects that are kind of minimal in a certain type of sense or something. So for example, symmetries of the Fano plane. And the monster was constructed as the symmetries of a certain type of space, which, well, had this number here that we have seen before. Uh, so this is really just, again, the same number plus one, whatever. So it is just explained as a, as a uh, symmetries of that space. It was like in the 18th ish. Okay? And the problem is it doesn't even explain moonshine at all because the space itself is just a large graph, if you want, uh, like this one here. So really, J2 is the symmetry of a large, large graph, it's 100 vertices. And M is the symmetry group of a very, very large graph, with 1, 9, 6, 8, whatever many vertices. And it doesn't explain moonshine at all. So people were a little bit like, mm, Okay. No, actually, I shouldn't say that. People were really happy that the monster was constructed, but the moonshine people, whatever the moonshine people are, they were like, oh, professor, um, we still, we're still not there yet. So that makes some sense. I hope that makes some sense. There was an observation that came from looking at character tables of those groups, um, and it hinted to a connection between two very different beasts, which is always exciting in, in mathematics. Two different things are connected, you are excited. And then the monster was constructed in a very different way, in a more the classical way how all the sporadic groups are constructed as symmetries of a certain very large object, a uh, certain natural very large object. Not going into details, constructing the monster is difficult. I will uh, comment on that later on. But that's essentially the story. And then Borchers came around, had this fantastic idea that you can generalize the notion of a Kashmudi algebra. So you could construct a monster Lee algebra, uh, let me just call it L, such that the symmetries of its Dunkin diagram are, is exactly the monster group. So if you want to think of, for example, the symmetries of the D4 diagram, uh, because you can just swap those vertices here, for example, you can just permute them through, that's a symmetric group S3. So you can construct symmetries out of uh, symmetry, symmetry groups, you can construct groups, out of symmetries of certain graphs that appear in Lee theory. So that's for just this baby example, um, S3. And kind of the monster Lee algebra, which is difficult to construct, I'm not going to explain, is essentially the same type of object, kind of the same type of idea. It's a Lee algebra, which is an associated Duncan diagram, and the monster is uh, the monster group M, is exactly the symmetry group of that Duncan type diagram. Oh, that's fantastic already. That gives a different construction. This is different from the one, um, the classical one from the 80s. So this was more in the 90s then. Uh, but even better, because it is a catch moody algebra or a generalized catch moody algebra, it has the usual nonsense formula associated to it, a denominator by denominator formula, by character formulas, all that fun stuff. And it turns out that those formulas spit out the J invariant. So that's kind of interesting. So we have a Lie algebra or catch moody algebra which has the usual associated formulas, which work for anything. Huh? And in this case, for this specific choice, this monster Lee algebra, they spit out the J invariant, uh, the J, the, the Klein's J uh, invariant. And at the same time, the symmetry group essentially of that Lee algebra is the monster. And there you go. Now we can piece things together and try to prove um, the, the kind of the connect, make the moonshine connection 
more precise, maybe I should say in this way. I hope it's reasonably clear. So there's a V algebra, it's actually a Kashmudi algebra, such that two things happen. The natural formula spit out the J invariant, and the, the, the Dukin diagram spits out the monster. So there's a quite obvious, kind of obvious relationship between uh, these two. And the, all these formulas are built out of root systems, essentially, and the root systems also build um, the, the Dukin diagram. And that's essentially the moonshine uh, connection through. Really, really sketchy here because this is kind of really difficult to make precise. But anyway, um, now I went to call them generalized Katsumudi algebras. So these are those Borchardt's Katsumudi algebras. Um, they're, they're, they're algebras exactly in the same way as Katsumudi algebras. They have generated in relations and they have all those character formulas, they have the representation theory associated to them. And L is a special case. And essentially, what you do uh, is instead of taking Katan matrices or S4 Katsumudi algebras, you take whatever, Borchardt's Katan matrices, whatever you want to call them. And essentially what you allow is uh, you have, don't have, you allow uh, non-positive diagonal entries. So usually for the classical ones, this is really bad. Let me try again. For the classical ones, you always have uh, positive diagonal entries, but for some, something like the L algebra, which arises as a special case, from the matrix, um, actually um, the entries are not positive. And that's kind of the idea. You generalize this notion, you'd have more uh, general matrices, and then you can just do it and just run the strategy and just construct this Lie algebra, which is an absolutely brilliant idea, uh, but it's kind of not so difficult. As soon as someone explains that idea to you, it's not so difficult. To get the technicalities correct, let's not worry about that. That's obviously not, well, maybe not obviously, but it's not super easy. I hope it makes some sense. You just generalize the world known story of the Trimudi algebras, but generalizing a little bit the matrices and what pops out is a more general class, but also this monster Lie algebra, which kind of connects the J invariant and the monster in a really nice way. I think it's kind of really, really exciting and beautiful. Okay, so here's um, a link in this in the description, uh, a picture I took from a, a what is it, a, a what is, I think, article of um, Borchardt's. And yeah, so Borchardt's ends essentially with this following. So the question, what is the monster? now has several reasonable answers, right? The, kind of the monster goes all the way around, people kind of guess its existence by character calculations, and then you need to construct it. Um, well, it's the largest sporadic simple group, uh, which is not a very satisfying answer, I think. But anyway, so I would like to ignore this. I, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether this is actually a good answer, but the other one, let's have a look at the other ones. It's the automorphism group of the Greece algebra. This was kind of the first contraction that I mentioned this graph that I mentioned. It's the automorphism group of a monster vertex algebra. That's another one. That's the kind of a vertex algebra that you can construct. And it's a diagram automorphism of our monster Lie algebra. So this is the one we uh, I actually addressed here um, in the final video. And then Borchardt continues, unfortunately, none of these definitions is completely satisfying, satisfactory. They're kind of all too difficult in some sense to explain um, or they're all a bit a bit artificial and therefore difficult um, to explain what a, what a monster vertex algebra is. It's not easy to explain what the Greece algebra is. It's not easy to explain what the monster Lie algebra is. It's also not easy. I personally think the monster Lie algebra is kind of the most natural one, but people will certainly disagree with this. In particular, Borchardt disagrees. And I kind of, well, it's still an open problem to find a really simple and natural construction of the monster vertex algebra, for example, right? Um, so it's not not easy to construct them, neither of them, neither two, three, nor four. Okay. So that's just what it is. Anyway, uh, monster tends to be, I mean, it's, it's a large, complicated group, so maybe we shouldn't expect an easy construction. But I hope the, the kind of the upshot here was clear. We kind of generalize, or we, let's say, both just generalize um, the description of of Kachmudi algebras to include a new algebra, a new type of Lie algebra, which is a monster Lie algebra, such that the symmetry group of, of automorphisms is the monster, and such that the natural invariants, the natural formulas we get from Kachmudi algebras give you back the J invariant. And I think that's pretty cool, and that's why it's uh, on my list. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.